Today's program features Dr. Brandy Jansen, Ayman Sharif, and Will Cap on the topic of In Pursuit of Food Justice Globally and Locally. Thanks for joining us today in person and via live stream. My name is Dave Martin. I'm an ICFRC board member and your host for today's program. This year marks ICFRC's 40th anniversary. We are celebrating our supporters, legacy in the community, and the bright future ahead for internationally focused programming in Iowa City. Check out our website, sign up for our monthly newsletter, follow us on social media to learn more about the exciting events that are happening this year. We want to acknowledge and thank our annual donors, sponsors, and partners for their support. And this list includes the Iowa Arts Council through the Iowa Department of Cultural Affairs, Humanities Iowa, and the National Endowment for the Humanities, the University of Iowa's International Programs, Honors Program, and Public Policy Center, the Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization, Midwest One Bank, Taxes Plus, City Channel 4 for providing online access to our programs along with the UI Library Archives, and last but not least, the Iowa City Public Library for their partnership providing our new home and for the refreshments served today. We are grateful for the longstanding support for those of you in our community who have helped our organization grow for 40 years to host speaker programs with experts joining us in person and online. As a small nonprofit, we are primarily funded by the generosity of individuals, and I hope you will consider making a financial contribution here today by scanning one of our QR codes in the room or by visiting our website later. ICFRC has adopted the Native American Land Acknowledgement prepared for the City of Iowa City's Ad Hoc Truth and Reconciliation Commission and Iowa City's Human Rights Commission. ICFRC recognizes that our home community of Iowa City now occupies the homelands of Native American nations to whom we owe our commitment and dedication. The full text of our of ICFRC's acknowledgement is on our website at icfrc.org. And now I'd like to introduce our speakers. Brandy Jansen is a clinical associate professor in the Department of Occupational and Environmental Health at the University of Iowa. Her research interests include local, farm, local food systems, rural environmental health, and community responses to climate change. She authored the book, Making Local Food Work, The Challenges and Opportunities of Today's Small Farmers. Ayman Sharif was born and raised in Sudan, migrated to the States, and has lived in Iowa City since 2013. An urban planner with a degree from the UI 2020, Sharif served as the City of Iowa City's Community Outreach and Engagement Specialist, focusing mainly on re-energizing the Neighborhood Association System and advancing goals to achieve greater civic engagement, connections, and participation. He served as a Johnson County Food Policy Council member from 2020 until October of 2023, contributing to the council's effort to improve and diversify the local food system. Sharif has been a director at the Center for Worker Justice of Eastern Iowa since May of 2023. Our third speaker is Will Cap raised in Iowa City and has worked on vegetable farms across the country, taught in the Iowa City schools, managed the Global Food Project for Iowa City Compassion since January 2021. Helping more people grow food in Johnson County, helping more people grow food in Johnson County and eat that food is his main goal with the Global Food Project. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Brandy Johnson, Ayman Sharif, and Will Cap, who will talk about in pursuit of food justice globally and locally. Sorry. Um, great. Our mics are working too, it sounds like. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you all for coming. This is a lot of people in this room to come hear about this topic. And yeah, we really, uh, we really appreciate it. Um, well, thanks for the introductions. Um, Maybe if we have any brief comments to, to add uh, about our introductions, I mean, uh, you can start. So, uh, yes, uh, <laughs> it was really exciting to be here with you. I'm so honored to uh, be here today to talk with you and speak with you regarding 
the topic which is very important for, I believe, all of you and the community at large. So I'm very excited. Yeah, likewise. What a lovely turnout. It's really great to see so many uh, folks interested in this topic. I don't have a lot to add to my introduction. I work a lot with farmers. I have for many years, and it doesn't really matter that I'm a professor at the university. I'm really just a farm kid from the Missouri o Ozarks. Like that's, that's really what, the part of my identity that really feeds a lot of this work that, I've, uh, that I do and thinking about food system stuff. And it's been a delight to get to interact with and work with Will and, and Iman over the years, too. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I just uh, one more thing to add uh, for myself. I am currently manager of Global Food Project, and we'll, that will be highlighting Global Food Project in detail in this presentation. Um, but I'm also the president of the board for the Immigrant Welcome Network of Johnson County, which is a new organization in Iowa City that's working to provide transitional housing and services to newly arrived immigrants to the, to the area. So, um, OK. So. We can um, get started um, talking about this. So what is Global Food Project? For those of you that do not know, uh, the brass tacks of it, um, Global Food Project, the first growing season was 2017. And um, the gardens are located at the Johnson County Historic Poor Farm, which is on the west side of Iowa City. Um, it's the farm that is owned by the county. It used to be the poor farm. That's why it's still the poor farm. Uh, that's why it has that name. Um, it was uh, used by the county to house a, a variety of folks that, um, that lost housing or were not able to be housed in other circumstances, so they lived out on the farm. Uh, the history is uh, kind of complex, but um, that is where that name comes from. I do always like to clarify that. Uh, the Global Food Project it was one of the first tenants and one of three tenants that are using the land out at the Johnson County Historic Poor Farm currently. Um, and the gardens are... Uh, oh, about the size of, maybe double the size of a, of a square table right there. And um, families can have, um, can have one or two plots out there. And there are nearly 100 gardens this year, um, although there were not always that many gardens out there. And it, is, it does function, generally speaking, like a community garden program. People have their own plots. They're planting what they want to plant. They're taking care of their own plots. They're deciding what to do with that food. Um, but we are providing a little bit more infrastructure, a little bit more services. Um, uh, we, do, we do workshops, we have community events, we um, provide plants and seeds and tools on site. There's water at the site of every garden. Um, and we do work to kind of reach out to, uh, to diverse communities in the, in the area. <clears throat> so I will let Iman talk about the beginning of Global Food Project um, because he knows more about it than I do. All right. Uh, so, thank you again. And uh, I think uh, it all, to me, it all goes back to the 2013. That year marked the first time I brought my family here to the United States from the other corner of the world. And um, I. I just came here to Iowa, Iowa City specifically, and that happened on March 13 specifically. But on April, I heard that the city has gardening, gardening plots that is rented. And it was just really very new for me, $20. I went to the city council, well, not the city council, the city hall here, and then the rec center and I was able to rent a plot over by Weatherby Park. Um, like a really a very solid start of an immigrant, but, but it was really tough because I lived in the west side of Iowa City at the time and I had to travel to that side of the city not knowing a lot of the things that really I need to know about gardening here. So what to do with insects, what to do with weeds, what, what is it? What is it? really that I need to know about this gardening opportunity. It was excellent experience for myself, but it was really tough because there wasn't uh, many chances for me to ask questions or to help or get help. So I had to navigate it by myself and my kids. Um, 
getting my hole and get there, get the seeds and start working. Um, uh, the, I just noticed that it is not the norm that you ask a person for help or you get help from a person next to you. So everyone walks in, they know their, their, their plot, they go there, do their business, and go outside. And not really a moment for talking or discussing or, hey, this is my problem, how I can do it. Um, so that really stick with me. Um, a few years onward, uh, forward, I joined the University of Iowa to complete an environmental policy and planning, and I became part of the, uh, the, the climate narrative project, which was run by the uh, Office of Sustainability. Jeff Biggers was the director of the program. The idea was all about uh, uh, introducing a regenerative Iowa City that covers areas of including local food production, among other sustainability, uh, energy, and all of those things. So having those discussions during the climate net, uh, project, um, Jeff Bickers was really excited about bringing a project that could really uh, create that model. And the, from that point, we moved on. And at the time, the county was really, actually since 2013, the county was working on um, like uh, reshaping the local food production and still continue to work. So it was a perfect time for us to get in and get in touch with the county. Shanti Cells at the time was the, the local food coordinator at the county and she was really excited about it as well, <coughs> equally. And uh, both of them became like really the, the, the most active board members at that time. So we went in. Here, maybe I'll go to the next one. Yeah, I think, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to talk about this a little bit here because part of the story is we were able to mobilize a wonderful group of people to become the board of the first few, uh, the core group to initiate that project. As you can see, very diverse people uh, from all over. Not everyone is here actually, but this captures many of the people uh, who became the first group to support the initiative. Uh, uh, so we went to the Board of Supervisors and we just like, hey, we want to uh, use this opportunity to create this project. And it was really difficult for the board to decide to give the county land to people that don't even know what they are in full. So uh, I would say having the momentum and the energy from the board and then at the same time having uh, a few professional immigrants, even more professional than myself, specifically we have an uh, agricultural engineer who immigrated from Saudi Arabia, a young guy, his name is Mamun. I don't think he's uh, here, but in this meeting, he was sitting there and he kind of displayed his resume his background, and he worked for in Saudi Arabia for more than 10 years, producing in mass living and stuff. And I remember Rod Sullivan said, hey, if you are able to grow in Saudi Arabia, you won't have any problem growing here. <laughs> so they just approved us for three, 2.7 acres of land for the project to kick off. So that's it for this. I'm going to see you. So the, the project was really taking the first uh, story I told about the community gardening and then reimagining that in a more holistic way, very simply. So, and uh, taking the opportunity as a, a community builder, 
cohesiveness, economic opportunities are uh, there, kids and youngsters are there, and this is exactly how we reshape uh, uh, global food project, or at the time, Iowa Valley Global Food Project. So we thought, no, so rather than everyone is working solely, no, let us work with something that unites us or connect us. Let us get, share the tools, let us share the seeds, let us uh, uh, find the same irrigation system, something that can really get us to talk with each other and be together, rather than going away. And it worked really well. So at the families were able to come out, um, and at the first year of the approval, this is the spring 2017, we, after securing grants, like some of them were federal, we were really lucky, and then local grants as well. So we were able to kick off with 20 families, and now Gul is talking about 100 plots. So, mm -hmm. so uh, and then the following year, we upgraded to 40 families, 40 plots, after just like seeing a lot of success and a lot of um, momentum. Uh, the project was really focused on uh, bringing the kids outside, creating uh, educational uh, uh, opportunities for them. The aim was really to, get, to make sure that when families are coming outside, Parents are there, but also the kids are there and having something. There's a lot of good on having everyone in the same spot to do things. So that was it. Uh, also, the, in terms of the diversity, uh, it was kind of attracting even established Iowa citizens to be attracted to the project. I personally believe that nothing moved or, uh, forward at the community level until people are just like overcome the fears or whatever feelings they have and work together. And I don't also think that happens when you force it, but when you create the environment for it, that can more probably work. So it worked well here. We have people who really liked, loved the idea and came out and joined together. I remember very well in this field, we got two persons guarding next to each other, an immigrant, professional immigrant who was just like having no job at that point, laid off and stuff, got hired in the field. Like people, so what do you do? I do this, I do the technology. Oh, really? I just need to do this. And then got hired from that field. So, so that was the kind of things that happen and interaction that happens in the field. Mm. So diversity was really the magic word uh, for that project and it kept it uh, uh, living until today, I believe. Um, without like extension, uh, like talking a lot, I just would like to highlight a few things. Like, uh, what really makes this work in my mind is this marriage between established culture component and established knowledge and arriving people. And this is very important because when we arrive from multiple places, we don't not only uh, have different views, but even our skills are different. So, and having a mind that is really uh, focused on building capacity is important on those projects. So as we go, we take people in as members, but also as potential leaders and potential professionals. And as we work, we just like exchange and get the energy and the knowledge flow. And that way people, while they are interacting with, with, each, uh, with each other, English, then <laughs> they move forward as well. Okay. The, and, and we see that really here because of the board. I, I, you know the board actually for a long time, this board, uh, the group were literally volunteer staff of everything. They did the ground writing, they did the fundraising, they did the, the accounting, and they did the managing. So, and I think, I believe, this skills, because it was donated over this noble course, the project was able to pass 
for world. Otherwise, it wouldn't. It would never get the chance to do that because this is expensive, everybody knows, and nobody will be able to pay for it, those skills. So it is important for that marriage to occur, always. It is not easy, I understand. It is difficult, but it needs things. It needs tolerance, and it needs patience, and it needs also courage. Most of the time, people will say, hey, I'm sensitive to immigrants, maybe they will Take me wrong. Don't do that. Don't do that. Just go wherever wrong you want to be. <laughs> At the end, people will understand. And things will go forward without any sensitivity, without being really re reluctant. When the language is a barrier, do not hesitate. You are learning. You are teaching the person in front of you. If he's not listening right, tell him you're not listening right. This is how it's, it is said. And people will understand. And things will move forward. So courage is important in my mind. Um, um, I think I would just like to uh, close by some of the uh, um, successes. Yeah, we were able to draw a large number of diverse families from the beginning, as I said, uh, offering the educational opportunities. We had a lot of training. I mentioned at the beginning, my lack of knowledge of everything that is Iowa City, but very quickly because of training opportunities, because we were able to pull people who can educate us, I, I and others were able to learn very quickly. The county people were also very supportive in providing resources whenever needed. So uh, those are the kind of uh, successes. Yeah, uh, I think I already covered my learning lessons and what I said, concluding that just embracing the idea of sharing and courage and uh, exchanging knowledge. We are all in this pipeline of learning. We shouldn't be, if we want the community to move forward, we should step over our fears and our sensitivity and go forward. We will succeed as a community and as a group together, definitely. I think this is all what I want to say. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, to kind of just before I talk about the transition and my role and where Global Food Project is at right now, um, just to kind of piggyback off something Iman said of not being afraid to make mistakes or just you know just going in and being like, hey, this is me and you're you and we're interacting rather than trying to be like, hey, I need to understand everything about Sudanese culture and I need to act like a Sudanese person if I'm going to talk to a Sudanese person. That's you know this is not the this is not the approach, uh, and I think that that's something that I've learned um, with working with all the gardeners out at the farm. And I say this about um, many people that I interact with, but um, especially it's especially true with gardeners um, from the other countries that I work with. Until somebody is making fun of me, I don't feel comfortable around them because as soon as somebody is making fun of me, then I know hey you know we're not we're not worried about this guy getting mad at us. We're not worried about offending this guy. And, uh, and we've broken it down. So anyway, if you're interacting with somebody, you're not sure, oh, is this okay? Am I interacting okay? If they make fun of you, it's a good sign. Yeah. <laughs> um, so after, so um, Global Food Project existed for three seasons, I believe. In, 16, 17. In, yeah, 16, 17, 18, 18 19, maybe? 19, and then okay. the pandemic comes. Yeah, for sure. Stop, yeah. So four seasons um, run by this board, this group of people, um, and then uh, at some point, uh, Global Food Project felt like, okay, we need to find like a home. We need to have a nonprofit that we're a program of, um, and IC Compassion became uh, that that program. So IC Compassion is a long running um, nonprofit in the in the area, and predominantly they're doing um, immigration advocacy work. The main thing that they have been doing the longest is uh, is legal aid. So people who are immigrants who are looking to navigate the immigration system um, can go there and they provide legal aid for a smaller fee than, uh, than, a, than a lawyer would. Um, there are many other programs that are, that are operating there. There's a food pantry. There's a cafe on Thursdays and Fridays that provides um, job experience for young adults with disabilities from immigrant families specifically um, because the woman who started that program saw that as a, as a gap. Um, in, in the area, and there's also mental health counseling, English tutoring, um, other things that they provide. 
So Global Food Project is now a program of IC Compassion. Um, and I believe that transition happened in like the, the winter of 2019. Does that sound right? Into 2020? Because I, I think that, you know, they were looking at the first year of gardens. How are we going to do this? This is a new program for us. And then March came and the pandemic came and everybody said, okay, let's yeah. just pause. We don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, so, so the gardens were on hiatus for 2020. And um, in January of 2021, I was hired as uh, the program manager. Um, I have a background in teaching. I taught in the Iowa City schools, and I also have a background in gardening. I was looking for something different to do, and this was a really, this was a good fit um, for me. And I'm very happy that, uh, you know, I found Global Food Project, Global Food Project found me. Um, and I started in 2021, and that first year, I didn't know any gardeners. Thankfully, Iman was very gracious and continues to be very gracious in talking with me and helping me understand, like, what is Global Food Project? Oh, it's just a community garden program, right? No, it's much more than that. It is about, like, breaking down these barriers, creating natural opportunities for people to interact with each other that are not forced um, out at the gardens. So I sort of started in um, with the you know, with the plots and just kind of decided, okay, I'm going to do a slightly different layout uh, than has been done before. The gardens had been managed in different ways. I believe there was one year where people had just rows and there was other, and there was kind of some management from outside on these rows of, of gardens, um, but we switched to more of this uh, plot system uh, where people have a little bit more flexibility over how they set things up. Um, and... The first year that I took over, I was reaching out to all these people and I was like, hi, I'm Will. You've never heard of me. I'm with IC Compassion. Maybe you've never heard of them either. Global Food Project is with us now. I would imagine if I was in the situation of somebody that was being reached out to that way, I would be a little bit suspicious. And I think that that, um, I think there was a little bit of that the first year. Uh, the first year we started, we had, um, we kind of went back a little bit. We had about 20 families that were there. Um, that were gardening. And after the first year, um, you know, sort of developing relationships with people, getting to the fall, people were like, hey, I have a, I have a brother that w really wants a garden. Oh, my mom really wants a garden. Oh, you know, I have a friend who really wants a garden. And, you know, it sort of started to build. So the, you know, the first year we had about 30 plots with 20 families. The next year we had about 60 plots with 40 families. Last year we had... Um, I believe we had nine, 85, 90 plots, something like that. Um, and then this year we'll have nearly 100 gardens out there. Um, in addition to the small family plots, there's also an opportunity for people that are interested in growing for sale to get a larger plot. We call those market plots. They're about equal to 10 of the family plot sizes. And we're working with Field to Family um, for folks to sell through, through Field to Family and also... Um, did some experimentation working with diversity market last year, selling produce there and starting a market at the farm. So just really trying to um, establish, um, you know, the skills that are necessary to growing food in Iowa, which as I said, many of the families that we're working with are not used to the climate here. Every year I have uh, somebody who, you know, I send out a message, hey, the frost is coming, harvest everything you need. Every year I have somebody come up to me, hey, what's this frost? What's what's really going to happen? It's not going to be that bad. And I say, no, no, all the plants will die. They say, what are you talking about? There's no way. And then they come out and they say, you know, I got a message last year. Will, the carnage. <laughs> Couldn't believe it. Every, you know, all the plants died. So, um, so just working to build up those skills, uh, getting people used to it, and just building that capacity in these different communities for people that already have so much knowledge about growing food and already have such a desire to grow food and are growing foods that, you know, are, are difficult to find a lot of times fresh um, in, the, in the community. So building up the capacity for those people to grow that food, building up um, the customer base so they know where to come and get the food, subsidizing those purchases so that they are accessible and available to, um, to customers. All of this is like, you know, they all kind of have to happen at once um, uh, for us to find success, but that's, uh, that's the goal. Um, the future, more land, more gardeners, more markets. So um, every year there's a waiting list, and even though we're increasing the number of plots every year, 
the number of people on the waiting list also increases every year. I was just telling Ayman the way that I'm doing the plot sign up this year. In the past, I've been like frantically running around, putting up flyers, reaching out to everybody. Who can I talk to? I need to get gardeners out there. I need to let people know. Now I do no outreach at all because the gardens fill up immediately. And rather than sending out a sign up to everybody, this year I'm doing like a very focused like one to one. You had a garden last year, you can sign up, but only this, only last year's gardeners first. And then after that, there's a long list of people who signed up in the past and also have sent me numerous message. Hey, where's my farm? Where's my garden? So those people are the next group that will sign up. And then after that, we'll, we'll fill in from there. But um, that will hopefully just get, uh, just build the community a little bit more, uh, get people at the gardens that really want to be there, that are really dedicated to growing food and, um, and, and figuring out how to do it here. So, um, by the way, this woman is Gaudens, um, and uh, Gaudens' daughter, Gloria, who owns a store in Coralville, called me a couple winters ago, and out of the blue, this happens occasionally, somebody will get my number somehow, and she called me and she said, hey, are you the guy with the farm? And I said, well, kind of, yeah. And she said, okay, my mom needs one acre. And I said, well... I don't have one acre, but I can give her a small garden, and we're thinking about having bigger gardens in the future. She said, okay, just do the bigger garden next year and give my mom the big garden. <laughs> and she just had, Gaudens had, Gaudens played the system a little bit, and she got a couple other people to sign up for two plots around her, and then she just used all those plots. So at the end of that year, I was like, okay, fine, you can have a big, you can have a big plot next year. But uh, I don't know how old Gaudens is, but... Um, she is certainly the hardest working person at the farm. Uh, she's out there all the time in the sun and the rain, always in bare feet on top of the thistle, which mm. just like blows my mind. Mm. Um, but, uh, she is somebody who's just like, the place that I want to be is the farm and I want to be in my garden. This is the place that I want to be. You're not trying to convince me. You're not trying to like show me anything. This is just where I want to be. And having so many gardeners that I'm not compelling them to come to the garden. I'm not like, oh, I have this service, please come use it. It's like people are like wanting to be out there, at This, which is really just like the, the, a great measure of success for the program, I think. Um, okay, so we've been talking about kind of like what Global Food Project is on the ground, the, the history of it, the, the nuts and bolts of it. Um, but... There are sort of these terms, um, food justice and food sovereignty, that, uh, that float around a lot. So I have a couple um, definitions up here. Oh, I, there was one more quote that I was supposed to have up here and didn't make it on the final one. Brandy, I hope you can forgive me. Um, so food sovereignty is this idea that people um, have, that it's the right of people to have healthy, culturally appropriate food that is produced through ecologically sound, sustainable methods and they have the right to define their own food and agricultural system. So food sovereignty, well, frankly, food sovereignty does not exist right now in this country. Um, you know, uh, there, you can imagine all of, the, all of the different ways that we are disconnected with our food, that we don't know how it's made or who makes it or where it comes from. All of these things are sort of uh, assaults on food sovereignty in, in different ways. But um, the way that you are able to rebuild that is to provide people the opportunity to do what they want to do, grow the foods that they want to grow, get those foods to their community, and hopefully that capacity and that, um, those opportunities uh, grow with that. And then, Brandy, if you don't mind, I think I'll pass off food justice to you. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I, think it, I also think it's really important just to... I like these concepts, and I like taking the time to think about, so what does this mean, and what does it sort of mean in practice, right? And I, the stories that Will and Iman just told, I think, give us a lot of insight into that. Um, one thing I will say about food sovereignty, I've been stewing on this for a while. I spent some time uh, on the Santee Sioux Reservation in northeast Nebraska last year, and we had the opportunity to have a meal prepared by Chef Anthony Warrior, who is this awesome guy. And he was talking about food sovereignty, and he said, one challenge with food sovereignty is we tend to equate it with ownership, mm. right? He said, which is colonizer thinking, right? Um, so he said, what I want is to share this food, and I want it to be available, and I want people to learn about our food ways, and I want people to be able to participate in the system. And so it really, because I will say I was certainly one who would kind of think, 
sovereignty of sort of taking ownership over your food system. And I think, ah, oh, maybe let's, you know, it kind of helped me walk back a little bit and think about um, rights and uh, knowledge and access and all of those things, but um, also with a, uh, an ethos of sharing and, and an openness, which I really appreciated. And food justice, like, you know, you could Google it up and get a whole, whole mess of definitions of food justice. And I've not done this, like, systematically, but I would guess that almost all of them would focus on um, increasing benefits, right, access to something. So consumers have more access, or farmers have more access to land, or markets, or whatever it is. And what I like about the definition from Gottlieb and Joshi, they wrote a really nice book on food justice uh, a few years ago now, um, but is that this one concedes that there are risks in the food system. And there are risks at every single stage. Um, and so thinking about food justice then is a way of saying, okay, we need to share both the benefits and the risks more evenly across the system. Right? So to Will's point that we are not in a space of food sovereignty right now, we are in a, also in a space in the US where the risks are disproportionately on some people. <laughs> and some people are, are benefiting disproportionately. And so I like thinking about it that way because it helps me think about it both at a really big scale if I want to. I can think about federal policy and the farm bill and what that means. But I can also think about it at a really micro scale. Like, I love your story. Well, I don't love the story about having a community garden and that you didn't, that the neighbors didn't talk. Like what, that's, for, I was, we need to step up our game in the, rest of the community <laughs> gardens in Iowa City. That's one, that's one thing I learned from that story. Um, but it also, it's, it, it shows how that lack of community put you and your food production at risk a little bit, right? You were here, you're in a new space. The soil is different. The insects are different. The weeds are different. And you're looking for knowledge. And if you can't access that, that increases your risk, right? Your crops are not going to do as well because you're, you haven't learned that yet. But on the other side, or in the other example with a, com a truly community garden where people interact with each other, they share knowledge, they bring all of these diverse experiences about food production, um, and they talk about them, share seeds, right, which is a very concrete way of literally sharing the roots of our food system, that mediates everybody's risk. You all learn a little bit more. Everybody sort of shares that risk among them because that knowledge sharing. And also, it's probably more fun to get to talk to people while you're out gardening. So I think, you know, when you think about what the risks and rewards of food are, then you can think about it if you want to think really closely right, right in the garden or thinking at those large-scale um, sort of scales, I suppose. Um, was I'm, I'm supposed to, I think next I'm supposed to talk about, like, local food and food justice. Yeah. Where's your confidence, Brandy? But, I don't know. <laughs> Next, I, I, talk it's about back, this. I think, I think, I think I shall talk about this. You can talk about whatever you want. Well. Um, I think you know. I I remember it, it was so fun to hear the stories when I was. Uh, I was also doing some research on local food as the Global Food Project started up and, and got up and running. And it was so exciting to sort of watch that happen. Um, and there are some other kind of comparable projects elsewhere in the state. And they look really different than a lot of the kind of I don't like, to, the word traditional isn't the ideal word to use here, but sort of the typical Midwestern local food projects of the farmer's market that is located downtown on Saturday morning, so you can only go if you don't work on Saturdays, um, or these very kind of typical um, farmer's markets, community-supported agriculture. And there are a lot of really great benefits to those models. I mean, they've, they've really, um, for many individuals, both farmers and consumers and uh, you know, processors and distributors have been game changers. They've really pushed the food system forward. Um, but they are a really, um, you know, Western model of, of food production and sales. And so it's really exciting to see true diversity in food production, not just the products, but also the community that surrounds food production, the sharing of knowledge and seeds and tools and space. Um, we don't do that so much in Iowa, right? We're really rooted in um, private property and fences. <laughs> <laughs> and on those kinds of things. And so a really uh, well interacting, you know, community garden is its own ecosystem of both plants and people and knowledge and experience. And so I think it has added so much richness and new ways of thinking into the local food system that maybe were not obvious to a lot of us who were, who were thinking about that work all along and doing that work and thinking about transitioning, you know, what transitioning corn and soybeans to more food that you, we can actually eat, which would be a good thing to do. I'm not, that's, let's, let's get there too. But um, in the meantime, we, we all learn a lot from these um, 
uh, new models that, that come in and, and we get to eat new good food, which is also a benefit. So, I know what, what I should say next. Oh, yes, you should now, yeah. the pitch. The pitch, <laughs> yes. Um, so, uh, the, if you have been compelled to be very excited about Global Food Project <laughs> uh, during this talk, uh, we are looking to sponsor plots. So the idea is that, you know, like I said, we have about 100 gardens out there this year. Um, we're looking for businesses, individuals, organizations to support our work, sponsor a plot for $150. You can sponsor as many as you like. Um, and if you are a business or an organization, if you know somebody who has a business or an organization, um, this is advertising. You know, you, your logo will be in the shed, on a plot marker at somebody's garden. Not only do we have about 70 families that we'll be working with that are out there, um, that will see the logo, uh, that will see the banner, but the Johnson County Historic Poor Farm is increasingly becoming a public place um, as the, the construction dwindles, not quite yet, uh, but as the construction dwindles and events start happening out there more, there will be more people out there. Uh, so you don't have to think about it as simply a donation, you can think about it as advertising. Um, and there's more information at the back table, um, but you can also find it if you go to our website, uh, iccompassion.org slash global food project. If you go to our Facebook or Instagram, uh, I hope that we're easy to find. Um, you can find more information about that there. Um, and then the last thing I wanna do, we have about 15 minutes left. Um, I think there are some gardeners here. I know there are a few gardeners here. Um, so I would like an opportunity for you all to hear from folks who have a garden. You've heard from, you know, Iman, who's the founder, me, who's the manager of the program. Uh, you've heard from kind of the administration side. But um, if uh, any folks who have a garden want to kind of talk about your experience, what your garden means to you, um, what Global Food Project means to you, uh, that would be awesome. We would love to hear from you. Oh, there, it's on, it's on, perfect. Um, my name is Amel Ali. Um, my family immigrated to the United States from Sudan in 2000. Um, so I have pretty much grown up here. Um, everyone jokes, all of the Sudanese family members say that I'm Amel al Amrikiya, which means Amel the American. Um, so at the time that I was introduced to Global Food Project, I had actually finished up doing a certification at George Mason. Um, it was a health equity leadership certification and I decided to do my focus on the intersection of mental health and agriculture. Um, and the reason why I did that was because I was feeling super disconnected um, from my Sudanese roots. Um, I felt like I wasn't engaging with the Sudanese population as much as I should be. Um, I feel like I didn't really, um, I wasn't really appreciative to the struggles that my parents made um, getting here. Um, and so when I went to an event a couple of years back, I asked Will if I could have a plot. And um, on my first day coming to my plot, I remember um, being very, very nervous uh, just because most people um, don't speak, you know, as well of English as I do if they're Sudanese or like, um, there was just a lot of different people there. And actually, I had one guy um, who was from South Africa come up and help me. And he took 10 wheelbarrows full of compost and put compost all down on my plot for me. And it was just like the nicest thing ever. Um, and then as I started growing like other stuff, I would have you know, a woman from Congolese, did you know that you can eat those leaves from your pumpkin, you know, like from the squash. Did you know that you can actually eat this part? Um, Parcelain, I think, is what it is. Like, I did not, that grows everywhere, and it's like a staple in the Sudanese culture. And so, um, yeah, I learned so much. Um, and actually, I, I feel very fortunate that I don't struggle with um, food insecurity. Um, my full-time job is working at Community Crisis Services. Uh, there we have a food bank. 
Um, and so what I did was take the food that I grew and take it to the food bank. Um, and it made me, you know, obviously this year I've like, I'm just gonna do okra. Like everyone loves okra. It's so easy. It's so amazing to grow here. Um, but it was really amazing to just like see how um, connected I got. And if I talk much longer, I'll start crying because literally like it means so much to me. I feel so connected to my culture um, and I feel, feel so welcomed in that space. Like that woman that he showed her daughter Gloria and her two kids are always like running around. Like I play with the little kids and have games. We name each plant. Will's daughter will go in and pick names for all of my plants. So it's lovely and it's just my favorite way that I've built community um, in Iowa City thus far. And like I can't say enough great things about how much this project means to me as an immigrant. Um, being able to kind of learn from adult Sudanese individuals who have plots too and get to, you know, build community with them. Thank you. Any other gardeners that want to want to talk? Okay. Any other questions? Any does anybody have any questions uh, for our speakers? Uh, and I'll bring the, I'll bring the mic around. I just have a question for Will. You said there is 100 from a garden right now. Is that because the 3.7 acre finished or because you don't have enough money to make more garden? Or what's the reason of only 100? Yeah. Because you said you have waiting list. Yes, for sure. So um, our land agreement with, the, with Johnson County and with the farm has sort of shifted over time when we came over to IC Compassion and we got started, you know, because that, well, first of all, the land agreements are like three years. And the one of the very first things actually I did at the job before I was like, I didn't even actually don't even know that I'd been to the Johnson County farm. Maybe I had, but I signed the land agreement for the next three years. That was one of the first things I did. And I believe it was for, you know, things had, things had shifted, other programs out there were growing. There was some, uh, not confusion, but maybe not, um, they're just, the, the future of Global Food Project was not certain. So the, that next land agreement, our sort of holdings at the farm had, had shrunk down to what we could manage. And we have grown ever since, and actually this year is the first year that we are using another organization, some of another, another organization's land. So I think the first year, um, maybe half of the land that was for Global Food Project, just because of staff capacity, restarting interest, maybe half of it was used by another program out there. The next year, it was like maybe a quarter of that land. Last year, we used all the land for Global Food Project. And then this year, we're borrowing a little bit of land from another organization. Um, I will say this is the last year of that three-year land agreement. So we are hoping to um, continue to expand and as infrastructure builds on the on the south side of the Johnson County farm, um, more land will become available. And I do foresee, um, you know, probably double the land that we have now, which I believe is about two and a half acres currently, um, going to going to Global Food Project in the future. And also looking at uh, future future other sites too uh, um, around the city. Yeah. Other questions for our speakers? Anybody? Does the $150 for the sponsorship go to the gardener for their expenses or to the county or? So the $150 goes to, so we supply tools. Um, we supply the irrigation system that brings water directly to each plot. We supply seeds, plants, um, compost, mulch. All of these things are available for the gardener. Uh, we also have, you know, overhead um, prices for infrastructure at the farm. So it's not that uh, there's like $150, an envelope with $150 waiting for it, for each gardener at the plot, exactly. But that money just goes to just the overall functioning of like that base um, family plot system that we, that we operate, yeah.
I just wanted to clarify. So what you're saying is the gardeners just need to invest their time. Yes. Yeah, the gardens do not cost anything. The larger spaces, there is a small fee for, and the reason that we do that is simply just to help folks understand as they're scaling up, okay, I have this plot of land. It's bigger than a small garden, but it's not, you know, it's, it's you know, roughly an eighth or a tenth of an acre. So this plot of land costs $30. Now I have it in my mind. If I'm trying to go to, for example, the land access program at the Johnson County Historic Poor Farm and get one acre or two acres, I now have it in my head, okay, an eighth of an acre is about this much, so then I can think about what it will be like to, to, to grow further. But the smaller family plots are free. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I wanna say thank you very much uh, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, and it's really exciting to have a project like this in Iowa City. Uh, I'm, uh, I have two questions. My first question is, I'm wondering, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about what the, the farmers, the gardeners elect to do uh, with what they grow? Is there a, a variety of what you see folks doing uh, with the food production? My second question is, I'm curious if you know of other, um, if you're in contact with others, uh, with other projects like this, elsewhere in the state or in the country, there's a, maybe a, a network of sorts that you can learn from and with and that knowledge can be passed and benefited uh, by more folks who want to do exactly what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. So um, I, I'll let Iman speak to um, some of the things that people do with their, with their produce, but um, a lot of people uh, freeze their produce. There's a lot of, um, a lot of gardeners, uh, Congolese gardeners, who are growing, uh, growing a crop called, it's either called Amaranth or Lenga Lenga or Bite Kute Ku. Um, there are other names for it as well. Kalalu is another name for it that I have not heard anybody at the garden call it, but when I found the seeds sometime, one time, that's what they were called. Um, and that's just a green um, that uh, many gardeners are sort of blanching and then freezing. So we had one gardener at the very end of the year, she kept telling me, she was like, at the end of the year, I'm gonna take a picture of my freezer and I'm gonna, sh and I'm gonna put it in the WhatsApp group so everybody can see it. And she did have her freezer full of these small Ziploc bags of these, of these cooked greens. Um, but uh, yeah, so some people are preserving, m mostly through freezing. Some people are canning. Um, there's a gardener who makes like a roasted tomato salsa um, every year. Um, and then some people are donating, like Amel talked about doing uh, with her plot. Um, and then, yeah, there are other ways of preserving food. The peppers, you always talk about the peppers. Yeah, and um, I think uh, we'll cover almost all of it. I will only add that uh, s some groups will definitely use this as community connectors more, so they exchange <laughs> most of the time. And I've seen many families, they r really diversify their production and then exchange, so everyone so one will specialize, maybe not specialize, but anyway. So tomatoes and stuff, but then I will take cucumbers and peppers and mm -hmm. stuff. So everybody goes home with broader <laughs> yeah. Yeah. production. Yeah, July and August are very generous times at the gardens. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then to speak to your other question, there are other organizations. The main one is Global Greens, um, which is a program of Lutheran Services of Iowa. Um, and they're in Des Moines, and I am in contact with a lot of the folks that work there, and they're very generous with just helping, helping me think about, especially like starting a market. They have a really successful market in Des Moines, um, and they've been helpful kind of uh, navigating like setting up a farmer's market and accepting um, EBT is a government process, it's really convoluted and confusing and very difficult to like know if you've done anything right until you just hear yes or no. So they've been really helpful kind of uh, with that. And then um, also talking about the programs. I will say it's really interesting too because there is certainly knowledge to be shared among programs like this that are similar, working with immigrants who are growing food. Um, but the program in Des Moines is very different because the population and the circumstances in Des Moines are different than Iowa City. And um, those are things that I have to 
learn about wholesale because I have no lived experience. But you know, there are things that um, that Global Greens does, and I have brought them up to gardeners uh, at Global Food Project, and they're like, "Yeah, that doesn't really make sense." I say, "Oh, well, why not?" They explain to me, "Oh, this is you know, the situation of." Um, uh, you know, there are a lot more refugees resettled in, in Des Moines than there are in Iowa City. So uh, a program like that is able to get a lot of money specifically to assist refugees, whereas in Iowa City, it's not to say there are no refugees in Iowa City, of course there are, but it's not like a specific resettlement site. Well, actually, it will be very soon, but um, if anybody came to the IRC presentation uh, last time. So anyway, just uh, working with those groups is really helpful. Again, Global Greens in Des Moines. I've been extremely generous and um, with their with their advice and help uh, for us, but it is really interesting to learn about how the circumstances are different, and you can't just replicate these programs wholesale from one place to another. Okay, let's give a round of applause to our three speakers, please. And and before I tell you about our next program, I want to uh, continue in I, our tradition here at ICFRC of giving our coveted Iowa City Foreign Relations Council mugs to our three speakers. <laughs> wow. wow. That's so exciting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Those can be used for coffee, tea, or beverage of your choice. <laughs> so our next program features uh, speaker Dr. Maria Popova, who will speak on Russia and Ukraine, Entangled Histories, Diverging States, uh, this will be at 12 to 1 p.m. on Wednesday, the 21st of February, here in the Public Library and online, where our speaker will discuss how, you all know this, February 2022, Russian missiles rained on Ukrainian cities, tanks rolled toward Kyiv to end Ukrainian independent statehood. President Zelensky declared a Western evacuation offer, declined a Western evacuation offer, and Ukrainians rallied to defend their country. So what are the roots of this war? which has upended the international legal order and brought back the specter of nuclear escalation. How did these supposedly brotherly peoples become each other's worst nightmare? Join us on the 21st of February to hear that talk. Thank you for joining us today, and we are adjourned.